Hello. So yeah, like Jed said, I'm Garen Means. Um, if you want to talk to me on Twitter, Garen M. I work at Etsy. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas. Um, I wrote a book called Node for Front End Developers, and I run a couple of groups in Austin for female developers. So that's me. And what I want to talk about is this book, um, Tina Fey's Bossy Pants. So it's a biography, uh, an autobiography, uh, that Tina Fey wrote about her, herself, as one does with autobiographies. Um, if you don't know Tina Fey, she's, um, she's the, the lead character on uh, the show 30 Rock. Um, she's on Saturday Night Live. She impersonates Sarah Palin very well. Um, and she's uh, the woman behind uh, what I think is considered the pinnacle of American cinema, the movie Mean Girls. Um, and yeah, that's her. Um, so the book is the book is really funny. It's it's hilarious, um, and as a result, became a bestseller. Um, and kind of the the thread that continues throughout the book, the theme is uh, this idea of success without infallibility. And I'd like to deal talk a little bit more about fallibility. So, if you're aware of the character Liz Lemon from the show Thirty Rock, or even if you're not, um, she's a really good example of of fallibility. Um, She's a very empathetic character. She's somebody who can, you can relate to immediately because she's not perfect. Um, and she's, she's a caricature of Tina Fey, but she's, she's not exactly like Tina Fey. Tina Fey is obviously very successful and wrote a TV show that she stars in. Uh, Liz Lemon just you know, writes a TV show and kind of suffers. Um, and her whole character is kind of about the conflict of wanting to do things um, and attempting to do them and having no idea if they're the right things or not. And it ends up being pretty hilarious. So contrast that with JavaScript. JavaScript is actually infallible, um, which you may or may not believe. Um, fallibility comes from us, comes from the developers. So, and I think we're all familiar with how that happens. Um, we fail to account for edge cases. Um, we don't really understand how our code is going to be used by people. Or, you know, we just kind of box ourselves into how we think something should work and we don't really uh, consider what happens when it doesn't. And we're maybe uh, a little fearful of admitting that it doesn't sometimes. So, key difference. Fallibility when it comes to Tina Fey is hilarious and it makes her more relatable or her character more relatable. Fallibility when it comes to JavaScript is not hilarious and causes us to lose users, causes us to lose developers if we're writing uh, APIs or code for other developers, et cetera. So, the, the difference comes from comedy, right? Um, comedy allows us to, to cope with things um, in our world. It allows us to cope with other people. It allows us to understand our world um, in a way that, that takes things like, like uncertainty and even tragedy and, and flips them around and makes them positive things that we learn from, um, or at least we can bond over, right? And computers have no ability to do this. So all, all, our, all our observations about the world are things that we need to communicate to computers um, and translate for them so that they can observe the world the, the way that we do. And this brings us to the rules of improv. Tina Fey's rules of improv that will change your life and reduce belly fat asterisks. And they are, one, agree. Two, say yes and. Three, make statements. Four, there are no mistakes. Just to explain very quickly what those mean, although this is not actually talk about improv because I've never done improv. Um, agreeing is obvious, you know what that means. Um, saying yes and means don't simply agree, but add something else to whatever's, whatever's being discussed. Uh, three, make statements, so don't ask questions, don't just stand there asking each other questions, but make statements, describe what's going on or what you're portraying that's going on, and there are no mistakes is also obvious. So, I searched for bossy pants rules of improv on Google and I got 14,000 results. So. I think, I think we can consider uh, at least that Tina Fey is apparently an, an authority on rules of improv because people uh, really enjoy these uh, succinct approaches or you know, maybe, they're, uh, approach, uh, maybe they're a set of rules that have existed for a long time and she's just reusing them. Like I said, I don't know improv, so I can't say. What I do know is that w uh, when I looked at these results, um, people were already applying the rules as given by Tina Fey um, to pretty much everything under the sun, um, including uh, business, uh, feminism, scrum, and fasting, which is a weird one to me, but I, I didn't click that link. Um, and just life in general. So this is, this is a popular approach for a lot of things. And I thought, hey, maybe we can do the same thing with machines. So our machines obviously like everything to be black and white. 
Um, they don't deal well with gray areas. They don't deal well with uncertainties. And so we need to create algorithms that allow them to do that, um, which is to say that rather than trying to feed them only correct answers, um, we have to teach them how to find the right answers, um, which is certainly more difficult. So let's, let's um, as a simple example, let's just talk about how we would apply these rules of improv to like a basic user regi regis registration form. So one, agree. Um, this is pretty easy. We save all the answers. We don't uh, necessarily save them in the database, but we save them in, in some kind of cache where they're not lost, so the user doesn't have to retype things. And so even if they're, even if they're incomplete, if they contain illegal characters, whatever, um, we want to try and hang on to that so the user doesn't have to re-enter information. Two, say yes and. And this is, this is simple stuff like autocomplete, um, content sensitive hints when you uh, mouse into a, a field, reusing info, um, all basic stuff that we see, right? Three, make statements. Um, we want to work with what we know. So as soon as we know something, ideally we want to be able to reflect that back to the user so they get a picture of where they are in this, this workflow that they're doing. And that can be like showing them a preview um, and like highlighting uh, the areas where they've missed things so that they know what the state of those errors is. And, but most importantly, allowing them to continue moving through the, the workflow. And finally, four, no mistakes. So if they have a weak password, we suggest a stronger one and we just make it a step to, to do more stuff on the site. Or if they have a non-unique username, that's fine. We'll just use a numeric user ID until they fix that. And this shouldn't be news. These are, these are not new ideas when it comes to um, UI philosophy. But with JavaScript, we can actually do more. Um, we can go a little deeper. Like, so we don't have to deal with just the user as far as a source of um, potential uncertainty. We can actually deal with code as a source of uncertainty because JavaScript does that really well. So let's improv some JavaScript. You should, you, you should think of your, your JavaScript as an improv partner. Uh, you don't have to do that, but I would like it if you would do that. So if you're writing a, a framework or a transpiler, um, if you're doing some kind of machine learning thing, you know, JavaScript really doesn't care. JavaScript is very happy to work with other JavaScript, and that's one of the beautiful things about it. It does that very easily. So any JavaScript that you write for other JavaScript should be cool. OK, so going through the steps again. One, agree. Because we have no uh, method overloading in JavaScript, we actually have, I think, a great um, opportunity. Because we can, we can do essentially infinite method overloading without ever having to declare other actual overloaded methods. So if we want to send multiple types of arguments to a function, we can, we can do that, and we can branch within that function as much as we want. And that's awesome. So JavaScript innately, like, when it, it wants to be agreeable, right? I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> uh, but JavaScript, JavaScript wants to take whatever we give it. Like, that's the way functions are set up, that we can just pass in whatever we want, and that's, that's part of the language. So we can, we can do simple things like checking for existence using type of, seeing what the length of an object is, um, that will tell us, you know, what, we're, what kind of data we're actually looking at. And a good example of that in the real world is the dollar sign, in, dollar sign function in jQuery, which um, can take an, an ID um, as a string. It can take an actual element. It can take the, um, the scope of edge execution. And it can take a string of HTML that doesn't even exist yet. And we get the same thing out of it, no matter which of those inputs we give it. So step two. Uh, is saying yes and. So uh, if, if there's a callback, of course, this becomes really easy. Like, we know exactly what information to supply after we've already done our agreement and uh, we're ready to, to move on. And if we can't tell, then we, we, we go back to those other uh, ways of, of checking what kind of output is expected, um, type of, et cetera. Um, but at minimum, we should, we should be thinking about returning some kind of chainable context object. Um, whatever our function has done, creating, creating that context and adding to that context um, and passing that back so it's still usable. And if we design functions in this way, which I think we do already to some extent, um, then, then we, we, we come out with a, a better result. 
or if they're asynchronous functions, then uh, then we 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 take a hopefully an argument that's supplied um, that moves on to the next uh, function that that needs to be called um, because. I, as long as things are working, like JavaScript would like to continue them working and continue like passing back usable information rather than you know nothing. And jQuery again is a really good example of this because uh, you get you get chainability if you're just modifying a certain object. Um, you you get you know callbacks if you if you're doing something that is asynchronous that uh, you need to run code after something's completed, and you get like these kind of luxury return values where where things are built up and you get. Uh, very useful information as the result of each function call. So three, make statements. Uh, the idea is that we want to create instances that are useful um, or objects that are useful, um, which means including as much information as we reasonably can and as people would reasonably want access to um, and making all information set available um, but you know maybe maybe not showing everything or um, also not confusing things that, that belong to the application with things that belong to objects um, and, and keeping a sort of separation so that you get an accurate picture of, of the state of whatever it is you're actually looking at. Um, and part of this, I think, is that you just return an instance automatically if you can. So rather than like making people go hunt for instances, you have smart defaults and you use those to create instances wherever, wherever you think that they're going to be needed. And in this way, hopefully, you allow access to a great picture of state from anywhere you are in the application. And uh, that's, that's really kind of the best you can do with JavaScript, because JavaScript doesn't usually have a, a great awareness of what's going on in the larger picture, but it knows what's going on with that object, or it knows what's going on with that application state. And the DOM is actually a good example of this. Um, because, if, of course, if you take a DOM element, you have all of its properties, all the things that are already defined on it. Um, if you want to make up properties and add them to that element, no problem, you can do that. And then each element has its own state, and whatever modifications you make, even in, if, you, if you create new properties, that doesn't affect what the actual uh, DOM and the API in the browser uh, consider that type of object. So four, no mistakes. If you're using try catch in your JavaScript, I think that you should probably be worried. Um, if, if you're not doing something that you have ab absolutely no control over, um, you should definitely be worried. Because try catch implies that you, you don't know what's going to happen, you can't, you can't foresee it, and you don't want to, which is kind of messed up. Um, because you can typically handle whatever error you think might occur. And so rather than putting a try catch around it, the obvious thing to do is just to try and find that error and handle it. So if you have people setting private properties or you're trying to keep certain things from being accessible, just don't make them accessible. That's easy. Um, if things are coming in as the wrong type and you're concerned that you're not going to get the right type of information, try to get the right type of information out of it. I mean, rather than, rather than just rejecting something because it doesn't match your API specification, why not look at it a little harder and see if you can actually make it fit? Bottom line, you want to be, again, agreeing. And if you can't agree, then return this and get the fuck out. Meaning your function, not you. Um, so, if if you get uh, an input that you can't you can't use, um, specifically what you would like, let's say that I pass I pass the value of bar into a function that's actually expecting a property bar with a value assigned to it. Um, so if I get that, there's there's no reason I can't actually check to see whether the value that I get passed in is usable, assuming that I have defaults for the other properties that might get set in that same object, and assuming that I'm able to differentiate between the types of things that are getting passed in. So I don't have to throw an error there if I can potentially use that information. And that's, that's basically what an error is, right? I, again, unless we're talking about like things like a server not being available or whatever else, um, things that you actually can't control, it's just us, f us failing to realize use cases. Um, and JavaScript is happy to help us with this problem if we're happy to write the code to do it. So in the real world, I think, again, uh, a simple XHR is a great example, because there are a lot of things that can go wrong with an XHR, and, and some of those you can't control. If the server's not up, the server's not up, and you're not going to be able to hit it no matter what you do. But some things you can try and work around. So if it's just timing out, if you're on a slow connection for some reason, you can always try again, right? Um, not 
to an unreasonable degree, but once or twice, sure. If you get a 500 error, like maybe somebody who, who wrote the server-side code was expecting a get and you sent them a post or something like that. There's no reason you can't try other methods of connecting to, to the server-side resource and um, hope that that gets you a little further. Of course, again, you can't, you can't always alleviate all your errors. I mean, this would be a very different talk um, if, if I had a way for you to do that. But we have good ways to handle the situations where you do need an error. Um, we have excellent patterns now for, for dealing with this. Um, I really like the error first callbacks that, um, that are a pattern, uh, I think that came from Node. I, I hadn't seen it before, um, where you, you first pass in the error information and then you pass in whatever data is supplied to the, the callback. That's great. And you can do the same thing in reverse if you're writing your code um, with, with error handling in mind. You can actually pass in an error, back, error callback first to uh, whatever your function is and, uh, and have that as a standard part of the way that you write functions. And that's, that's kind of cool as well. And um, the great thing about those kind of callbacks is that you can, you can just suppress errors if developers don't choose to supply them. So it's opt-in error handling, and you leave it up to the developer to decide whether this error is important or not. So I'd like to talk now about how this relates to the golden rule. The golden rule, I think, does everybody know the golden rule? Yes, probably. Nobody, OK. <laughs> that guy. Um, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Applied to coding is simply, you know, something like code it like you have to use it. Um, and that includes um, not only coding it like you have to use it personally, but coding it like you might have to use it for something other than the use case that originally inspired you to write whatever it is, a framework, a transpiler, some kind of tool, um, some utility, whatever. Um, so not only like you have to use it personally, um, but like you might have to use it for other things. So why, why agreeable functions for this, to fit this golden rule? Um, because we want functions to be reused, right? Like we write them to create abstractions that make things easier so we don't have to write the same code over and over again. Um, and so the best, the best functions are, are decoupled, they're reusable, and uh, that makes them easier to use and they get used more, simple. Why affirmative return values? Um, because returning true at the end of a function, unless it's a utility function that explicitly tests whether something is true, is, I mean, you might as well return anything. Like you, you, you can't get any value of, out of that. And so if you return something that's more than what people need, the worst case scenario is that they don't use all of it. Big deal. And we don't write a lot of pure utilities anymore. We have good utility libraries right now. And so more often, uh, what we're doing is actually altering the context of some object that exists. And so it makes perfect sense to return that object, and there's no reason not to. And with asynchronous uh, functions, um, we have, you know, you can return a promise, you can um, use subscribers, um, and you can still do the same thing so that you continue the flow of your application um, at every point and nobody ever has to go looking for that object they were modifying or a way into that workflow that involves several next functions. Imperative states, because we want to have a, a clear picture of the app that we can control at all points and that includes all the objects within it. Um, and it's, it's good to have access to curated information, if you will. Um, as much information as makes sense, not a bunch of like private variables that aren't really private that you don't need, that are just setup stuff. Um, creating, creating a good, useful state is, is very helpful, obviously, and um, also avoids you getting into situations where you say, oh, that's, uh, that, that's not settable, or that's, that's, you change this in one place, it has other effects in other places. You, you sandbox these things and keep them separate from each other, and in that way, you get, you get clear pictures of everything that you're working with, ideally. Um, because once people start setting properties on an object or trying to use it, they want, they want to feel like what they've created with your code is, is a, a good-looking object, and they, wanna, they want it to do what they want it to do, obviously. And why no, her no error, er error handling? Um, because, again, exceptions are useless. You can't do anything with them, so obviously uh, you should strive to avoid them rather than striving to uh, indicate to the user how, how they should avoid them. Your code should avoid them. Um, and there are lots of ways to provide opt-in er error information so that you can, you can make those errors optional for people who want that error information. If somebody really needs something to happen, that's cool. They can get at it. But 
If not, why, why screw up their application because your code expected something to be a certain way and it wasn't? So if we just give developers access to what they want, then that's, that's kind of the way the JS works best. And just a little bit more about errors. Errors become useless on production, right? Like, what, what good is an error on production that your user sees? Not much. I mean, maybe it's good in development, but um, once you get it out to production, it's, it's valueless. Mostly, though, my problem with errors is they encourage us to, to narrow the definition of what our code should do rather than expand it. And that's not helpful. That doesn't get us anywhere. Every error that we throw makes us feel, uh, the, or, or the developers working with our code feel less in touch with the code that they're actually working with. It, it makes it less friendly, it makes it less appealing, and it, it reduces its usability. So again, the golden rule. Your code needs to be a good improv partner, um, because if it's not, then your code and the developer who's using it fail together. And your code's always going to be built upon. So even if you're not writing a library, even if you're not writing a toolkit, somebody's always going to come along and work with that code. You should anticipate that, um, because the alternative is that whatever code, uh, whatever website your code is on just gets scrapped. And I mean, that's, that's no way to think. Um, so people will do, do things with your code that you don't anticipate, be they large or small. And the idea is that you want to try to um, account for that. Because JavaScript really wants to be empathetic, like Tina Fey. We already have these language features that, that sort of uh, encourage this. We have, we have these, these function signatures that are not uh, tightly defined. Um, we, can, we can sort of pass in whatever we want. That's part of the language. If we want to create an object state, we want to create multiple object states. We want to uh, clone object states. Um, we want to set uh, properties to be, to be transparent and uh, changeable, or we want to keep them private so nobody messes with them. Like, that's all part of JavaScript. We can, we can just do that ad hoc and change whatever we want. And we don't need to say that some, some code might create an error. We don't need to give a heads up to the executing um, the, the browser, um, or whatever, or node. Um, we, we can just deal with those errors if they come up, and hopefully they don't. Um, and we have this blurred line between the people who are the users and the people who are the developers. They're, they're probably more close um, than in any, other, in any other language I've ever worked with, certainly. Um, and that's important because that means that the way that people interact with JavaScript is, I think, a lot more the way that they interact with the web in general, even when they're developing it. You always kind of have that, uh, that, that picture of a user in your mind because you will at some point be a user. I mean, for instance, how many people have, who, who have developed with jQuery have also used a website with jQuery that they didn't create? Like, I think probably everybody in this room who's ever touched jQuery, that would apply to. In the future, um, it gets a little fuzzy because we have, we have these new standards, um, we have new uh, languages that um, compile the JavaScript, and they, they try to um, maybe uh, pr protect us from the dynamic nature of JavaScript. And that's cool, but um, I think it's important to remember that you can write J JavaScript in any language you want right now. So if you want to write JavaScript that looks like Java, you can actually just write Java and compile it down to JavaScript, and you're done. Um, with JavaScript, we get unique opportunities. We have, we have, we, there's value in, in the dynamic and fuzzy and messy nature of it because, again, it works very closely with the user. And it's, if, if other languages are drama, it's more akin to comedy because it, it works, um, Again, uh, in, in a, a fuzzier way, and it deals well with the types of uncertainty that we're often um, finding ourselves trying to model. Uncertainty is kind of hard. Um, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that like, this stuff is, you know, you just go grab a framework and you're done, right? Um, it's difficult to encourage good coding practices if you're allowing like, all kinds of arguments. Um, it's hard to do chaining if you don't know what exactly you're going to be passing into the next function. Um, Having these potentially limitless state hierarchies in like tons and tons of instances, you don't really know what, how they connect together, or whose parent is whose, or whatever. Like that's hard. And of course, moving on after you get an error, um, after you you get an incorrect input, like and still giving useful information and still keeping yourself in a useful state is is very challenging. But it doesn't mean it can't be done. The the trade-off, of course, is that we get code that's very very much decoupled. Um, we get, we get things that, that don't have a dependency not only on each other, but on any sort of API or 
on a, a very strict API. Um, and that allows us much greater potential because we can, we can create things um, that, that we didn't envision and we're, we're building tools specifically to create things we didn't envision rather than just kind of hoping for happy accidents. So in short, we get empathetic systems that people can actually relate to because they're actually working with people rather than just telling them no when something happens that, that they, they didn't account for. JavaScript basically wants to be hilarious. Um, predictability um, is great, but it, we can do predict predictability. Everybody knows how to do predictability. Um, legality, like whether something's uh, an appropriate argument or an appropriate uh, output. Um, again, boring. We, we know how to do that. We know how to work with that. That's not challenging. Basically, forcing other people, other developers, to conform to our expectations is not challenging, it's not interesting, and it doesn't move us forward. Um, and JavaScript does this well. It, uh, it, it, it does the alternative very well, and I think it works best that way. Thank you. Awesome. We still have a little time to uh, take some questions. Does anyone have? Do you see hands? Anyone? Um, okay. Can you think of any specific APIs that you would emulate or that you would see that's out there on GitHub or something that I could look at and get an idea of you know, someone that's using approaches like this to design? I think that, I think that jQuery does this really well. Um, I, I, like, I, as far as like, Node and like, uh, frameworks and stuff, I don't, I don't have a good answer. Um, but I, I think that the way that jQuery has, the way it, it's evolved um, to kind of like, do this kind of stuff to be like, we don't know what people are going to do with this, so let's just try to cover all the bases is a, a pretty good start. Yep. Anyone? All right, cool. Thank you very much. Thanks.